And hello, hello, and welcome, everybody. Landon Wright here, media director at HowChurch.net. Hope you're all having a fantastic Tuesday. It's that one Tuesday, or, well, one of the few Tuesdays a year where everybody's a little thrown off. We all think it's Monday, but it's not. Hope you all had a great extended weekend. We're doing something brand new here. I really hope catches on. I really hope gets very, very popular. It's something I hold near and dear to my heart. I'm a big pa fan of podcasts, and I said, you know, why don't we try one here? You know, because uh, everything's great, but it's just a little bit better when you do something for God. So, anyways, landing right here, going to be the host of this little ship. Hopefully, all of you watching, you like, share, and all that good stuff. Tell everyone about it. Joining me right across the table here, we have the very distinguished, very honorable Pastor K.D. And on a real note, Pastor K.D., great guy. Uh, he's done. He's been nothing but great to me. He's nothing but great to the church. Very, very smart guy. And I'm just, you know, he's very busy man he's hard to find and especially if you drive by the church and see all the construction going on you can see he's got a lot of people to talk to but he's taking a little time out of his day to come have a little table talk session so thank you pastor for being here today it's an honor to be here i'm glad that we're able to do this and hopefully uh many people will get some help we pray and ask god to give us some wisdom and thank you for your time and for setting all this up and for having a desire uh, not only to do this but to use your gifts and your abilities see you can't do what i can do and i can't do what you can do but god's gifted us differently not to make us uh just different for different sake but and not to make us interdependent uh, upon one another but interdependent upon each other so good to be with you yes sir i'm already learning stuff interdependent i, I hadn't heard that one yet <laughs> so nice big word little preacher that's it that's well i didn't say that but anyway <laughs> Well, look, uh, Brother Keith, I was thinking the other day, a little something that came to mind is, uh, you know, right now, as I drive through central Louisiana, I drive through uh, around the Grant Parish area where we both live and all that, and I see just everybody rebuilding their yards. I see Clico men rebuilding the power grid, a lot of rebuilding and going on in this area uh, in a physical sense. But I got to thinking, I was like, you know, there's a, you never really can tell unless you just really know that person but somebody might be doing rebuilding just like that, but rebuilding in their own life. So, um, for example, your job could be your power. You're out of the job, well, you're basically doing a, a version like what those Clico men are. You're trying to get some, some, some cash flow going. Uh, you know, whether it be relationships with another person or some people, you know, they just, they just need a reason. They just need something. I mean, you know, you have people that just don't see a reason to get out of bed sometimes. So a lot of rebuilding goes on in people's life and uh, something else I wanted to tie into that later on but I just wanted to kind of get your thoughts on this um, people are always in a way rebuilding especially when you have your life set up how you want it there's still work to be done uh, what I want to say is, is, is what is what is your main takeaway here when it comes to rebuilding and making yourself valuable well I think it's a good question let me just say this is that first of all as you know, uh, we want to just continue to pray for all the hurricane uh, victims and, and thank God for linemen and thank God for an air conditioner. But we, we just want to be praying for all those people and, um, you know, ask God to help them because they, there's so much displacement going on. Uh, there's so much uncertainty. And uh, by the grace of God, we were able to weather that with, with few, um, uh, you know, fatalities. And so, uh, you know, when you talk about making yourself valuable, um, I think the very first thing that a person needs to do before he or she pursues anything is sincerely get before God. Um, there is no substitute for praying and asking what God would have you to become and do. So we would like to separate secular from spiritual. Here's what I do in my spiritual life, and then here's what I do in my secular life. Okay, when I go to church, this is the, what I do. And then when I'm out in the work, this is what I am do. But this is what I do. But, but you can't separate. Everything's spiritual to God. And I think if you're going to have true fulfillment, if you're going to really make an impact and you're going to make a, a difference, not only to society, but even a difference in your own life, you've got to ask God, God, what is it you want to do in and through my life. So I think the very first thing you have to do, it may sound so surfy spiritual or cliche, but it's pray. 
Let's pray. God, what is it you want me to do? And, and when I didn't have a direction or purpose, and um, I graduated high school, I'm like, what am I going to do now? What, 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 what am I going to do? Everybody else, I'm going to be a dentist. You know, I, I'm going to be a football player. And I'm like, I don't know what I need to do. And then I found Christ. And when I found Christ, my life changed. And all I wanted to do was please him. So I asked God, God, what is it you want me to do? What are you calling me to do? Uh, I don't want to be the best of all the rest. I just want to be my best. And so I prayed and asked God, God, what is it you want me to do? And he said, I want you to preach. Now, I was on my knees praying when he asked me this. And I thought he had the wrong room because I was in, a, you know, I was in the, um, you know, uh, military at the time. And I was coming out of boot camp into uh, RMA school. And uh, we had all the barracks, and you had these, you know, just rooms full of people. And I was on my knees praying when I asked him that. I thought he had the wrong room, but mm -hmm. he told me, no, I called you to preach. So I think the very first thing it is that a person needs to do is pray. And then once you lock in to what God wants you to do, then I think that comes with a plethora of things. I, I think from studying to being teachable, uh, to finding mentors that will train you. Um, if you can go to college in that, in that area, uh, I think you ought to pursue uh, that as well. Uh, but there is no substitute for, for finding what God wants, for being teachable. Because, see, once you find what God wants you to do, you're going to become passionate about it. And, and the enthusiasm is going to be there. And if you're passionate and exciting, excellence is going to be there. And so don't, don't go try to go get a job because it pays a lot of money. I know a lot of people who make a lot of money that hate what they do. I mean, go through all their life, uh, you know, having a job because it pays good, but wake up every morning and, uh, and, and, and they're miserable. Uh, have a pocket full of money and a hole in their heart. So, you know, with finding what God wants you to do, and then being a student of that, I remember uh, one year I made a, a made a um, just a a goal. I wanted to read fifty two books on leadership. Mm. Fifty two. That's a book a week. I think I, I never was good at math, but I think it's a book a week. Uh, close to <laughs> yeah. it. And so I, I studied and I read and 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 I just read and read and read till it just become part of me. But I didn't say, God, you called me to do this, now do it all. I did the possible and was praying that God would do the impossible through me. And so uh, that's a beautiful combination. Finding out what God's called you to do, being teachable, read, being passionate, get all the education you can get, and then do your job with excellence. Yeah, and, you know, that's, that, that's very important uh, from a job standpoint is, of course, you want to do everything – uh, Job-wise, excellent. I mean, if you are scrubbing toilets with a toothbrush, you do it excellent. And I mean, I, and, and that's unto the Lord, he says. Ex absolutely. And, and and folks, that's easy for me and Pastor Keith to say. Cause we're sitting in these nice, comfortable chairs. These are nice, by the way. <laughs> uh, sitting in these nice chairs saying all that. But, you know, I know he's been there. I've been there. You know, it's just something you have to do. But, uh, you know, getting back to what you were saying about praying on it and uh, making sure that it's what God wants you to do, uh, that, you know, that, that bears repeating because that is the most crucial uh, part of it. And, folks, I wish it was the same for everyone. I mean, you know, I wish it was like in the book of Genesis. You just hear that voice of God, you know, talking, and, it, and it's easy. There he is talking to you. I wish it was that easy, but but then uh, but then that would be too easy. So you know it comes to everybody, but but for me personally, when I was praying on actually coming here, a uh, little small backstory on me: I was uh, went to Grand High School, went to Northwestern State, uh, majored in broadcasting and new media. Uh, eventually got my master my, my bachelor's degree, not a master's, and um, moved back down here. For the past two years, I did radio here local. Uh, I enjoyed it, but I just wasn't happy with the industry. It's not really a, a, a line of work I was willing to to put myself through. So that ended, and then we had the COVID nineteen. I don't have a job or anything. I was I was going through going through some 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 pretty thick wilderness there, folks. And uh, 
Anyways, I reached out to an old high school friend who just so happened to be your son. He told me about this job only, and then came out of conversation. All these little variables lined up perfect. So I prayed on it, and, and where I was at that time in my life, I was like, well, I want to do media. I know that for sure. It's just I feel like, you know, that, that right there, that's kind of like, you know, God has that little thing in my brain saying, look, hold on now, this is what you need to be doing. So I knew that. I wasn't crazy about getting lined up full-time religious because I didn't know what it was going to be like. And so I was scared of it, scared to death, prayed, which at the time in my life wasn't doing a whole lot of. Uh, so prayed again and, and thought about it. And then that's, it's all of a sudden, folks, it's just, you know, all those thoughts, they were already in my head, st same thoughts. But it's like the right thoughts became a little clearer after that prayer. And let, let me just say this, you know, even with your experience, a lot of people think, well, I do what God wants me to do, and it's all going to be rosy and hunkadory. But when Jesus got on the boat with those disciples, he said, let's go to the other side. Well, on their way to the other side, they're with Jesus. They're in the will of God, and a storm comes. And I think when storms come, it really tests our motive. Why are we really doing what we're doing? So if God has you here, and he does, and God's led you here, and he has, you don't leave until God tells you to leave. That's you true. don't leave when the storm comes because you're going to have storms. He said in this world you're going to have tribulation. So if you're going to stay valuable in the work spot, you're going to have to you're going to have to get some bobos. You, you're going to have to get some uh, battle wounds. You're, you're going to have to go through the difficult times, not just the joyful times. And, and I find out that uh, time has a way of telling off on people. True. Uh, you know, oh, when they come in, I'm going to change the world. You're, you're not going to have to worry about me. I'm a lawless. I'm committed. And sometimes it's not even three days later somebody shows up late i, I mean, was going to say normally it's that first <laughs> week but some people yeah. some people do it in record time so. yeah. and uh, it doesn't make them a bad person it no. doesn't make me um you know some wonderful boss and them some bad employee but my point is is consistency and faithfulness and and getting prepared to go through the storms and the trials you, you know here's here's what's amazing is no matter where you go you're going to have problems and you're going to have difficulties and you take you wherever you go. So the best thing to do is go ahead and learn where you are. But people want to start somewhere else. They're, they're like, this is too difficult. So what I'm going to do is start somewhere else and become valuable. Well, you take you wherever you go. And if you couldn't weather it here, you're probably not going to weather it there. And if you don't, if you're not careful, you're going to have a tendency to think out there is where I need to be. It's not out there that needs to change. It's in here that needs to change. It's in here. It's my attitude determines my altitude. My outlook determines my outcome. I mean, when things happen, and they will, they will, it's just important that you remember I was sent here by God. And I, I think last time I read in this beautiful book, Jesus had one or two difficulties. But I'm sure glad he didn't quit on me. Well, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, and like, you know, and, and not just with myself, of course, with myself, I think this way. But then when you look at the rest of the human race all tallied together, I mean, we've given that guy plenty of reason to give up and he hasn't. And that and, you know, like when I was thinking to this job, I've, uh, I love it. I uh, absolutely love it here. Everything's been great. But there's been, you know, when that when that COVID started wearing off and then the regular workload picked up, I was like, oh, boy, this is. I mean, I was used to getting off at four every day. What's hey, let, let's, you know? just, let's just be honest. Let's deal with something that is so misconstrued when it comes to church work. I've had so many people, after 31 years, staff members, they've even told me, they've, and they would consider themselves workhorses. I mean, like, if you were to talk to them, they'd tell you, man, we, we can bow up and we can get it. And they thought church life was, I guess, you come in and everybody's over in a hu holy huddle. <laughs> everybody's praying and eating donuts and you know reading a scripture too and just you know kumbaya but i find out when people leave out there and they come to howchurch.net they like man i didn't realize what it took to make sunday a success i didn't realize the work and the effort and the extra hours and the energy and and I'm like, yeah, everybody's got this misconception about what we do 
as in the church world. And then they come here and they realize this is a 24-hour job. Absolutely. And, and just like getting in the boat with Jesus, you, you don't know where the storm's coming and who's going to bring it and what's going to bring it. And you just got to hold on sometimes and, and faith those difficult times because it's just not easy. But nothing's easy. Nothing's easy. Anything worth value, anything worth having is not going to be easily obtained. There's no shortcuts to success, and there is no elevator to the top. Everybody's got to take the stairwell. And uh, if you're going to succeed in life, you've got to remember what you called for, where you called to. No storms are coming, but that's how you mature. That's how you grow. That's how you, that's how you get to where God wants you to be. And, and by the way, let me just say this. If you do decide to go somewhere else and quit, when you get ready to go back to the school of life, guess what test is going to be issued? The one that you failed last time. Yeah. So God's not going to say, you know what, that was pretty tough on landing. Uh, he couldn't hack it there. Just put the test up. No, he's going to say, uh, where's Landon? Landon is no longer there. He's here. Well, I'm trying to teach him something because I love him. Give him the same test. Yeah. It's and either you're going to pass or fail. And if you pass, you grow. That's it. Yes, sir. I was... Uh, you know, that, that's exactly true. And I wanted to kind of use my situation with other people that uh, not so much, you know, you get afraid of a workload because, I mean, if you're in the workplace, you got to have that work ethic. But uh, one of those things I was like, oh, man, am I, am I going to be able to handle this? Because, you know, I, I finished college last December, folks. It ain't even been a year yet. And, uh, you know, in those first two or three years don't really count. I had, I had a little too much fun, so I didn't really learn much. So I'm thinking, I was like, I know what I'm doing but I've never been a department head. I've never been in charge, and and it's almost like God spoke directly to me, and He just and, and, and I realized, you know, this this whole thing happened by some very specific things, some very specific variables. If I wouldn't have happened to come to the rooftop service, if I wouldn't have happened to text Mike, and all these things wouldn't have happened just right, I'd still be in the unemployment line. I was like, so it. You know, it's it, it's not an accident. This is God's plan, so I at least need to, you know, if I think I'm underprepared, well, he doesn't think so. And, of course, things came a little easier, so folks, just don't get scared, and, you know. And, and let, me, let me interject something. You know, you brought up about how to be more valuable. You know, when you go to work, you don't go to work um, trying to see what time you need to be there necessarily and what time you need to leave. The, the thing that I would say to you, Landon, that you've done somewhat and you're learning to do better is that go to your boss and you ask your boss, what is he looking for? Of course, you do all this in the interview before you even get there. But, but let's say that he doesn't ask the right questions and you don't, you don't ask the right questions. And, and now you're at work. Let's say, you know, maybe you're working at Procter & Gamble. We, everything's not church about this conversation. Absolutely. But, but you find out what, what your boss's expectations are of you. And, and I would suggest that when you go talk to him, always bring a pen and paper. Don't ever, don't ever sit in front of your boss and uh, think that you're going to remember everything. You, you, someone said it like this. You think with your brain and you remember with your pen. So you're sitting in front of him. And, and you're asking him, how can I add value to this organization? Now, that should have already been discussed prior to you getting hired, but, but let's just say that didn't take place, and it doesn't take place in a lot of work spots. But, but how can I add value to this, to this church? I, you know, and if he wants, uh, for instance, if he wants apples, let's, let's say he says, you know what, Landon, I want you to bring me some bright, beautiful, big apples. And the next day you walk in with a box of bananas. Yes. And, I mean, you worked hard to get those bananas. Say you went all over the community to get bananas. You, you counted the bananas. You had all the bananas stacked up in a row. You put it in a nice banana box. I mean, everything, anything and everything about a banana you had covered and you brought in there. Now, the boss is not going to be happy that you brought bananas. He wanted what? Nice, big, beautiful, bright apples. And, um, and so if you're going to add value to the work spot, you've got to find out what your leader wants, and you give the leader what he wants, not what you think he needs to have. See, he was there before you. That job was there before you showed up. 
So for you to show up and say, hey, you need bananas, and here's how you need bananas, and I've got plenty of bananas, that's just not wise. So the principle there is to find out how you can add value, write it down, listen to them, and do it exactly as he asked you, but do a little bit more. Be a then some person. If he wants you to do a mile, give him a mile and a half. Uh, if he wants you to do something, do it quicker, do it better, do it sharper. And then what happens, watch this, and I'm just expediting through this conversation. You become so valuable to the organization and to your leader that he can't get rid of you. He'd be foolish to get rid of you. Why? Because you're bringing the best, shiny, brightest apples that he could ever imagine. And you brought more than he ever thought you could. And you brought them sooner than you thought. And then you asked, was there anything else you could do? Now, let me just say this. A lot of people call those people yes men. I'm not going to be a yes man. I'm, I'm going to do, you know, these cavalier, strong-willed, I'm in charge people. Well, find out how they're, find out if they don't switch jobs pretty frequently. Find out how valuable they are to any employer. It, you cannot bring that type of personality. You've you got to understand people are not going to always be the extra mile people, but you be it anyway. Don't get into that yes man stuff. Get into that I'm God's man and I'm going to serve my boss like people think I'm serving Jesus Christ. Because guess what? If God sent you there, he wants you to perform at a high level as though it's unto him. Your boss, your boss is just a facilitator. Your boss is just someone that God's using to give you a check. But you're working to God. Yes, sir. Actually, uh that, that that lines up perfect with a little something uh, we as a staff have been uh, studying in our private Bible studies. Well, I say private, our, our staff Bible studies, uh, reading uh, these little devotional books. I talked a lot about delegated authority, and, you know, a lot of people, a lot of employees and stuff, and, and uh, folks, I don't claim to know it all. I just call it how I see it. And uh, I've noticed that, that a lot of people do get discouraged because, they maybe not, not necessarily like something that's going on with what they've been told by their superior, and they're just like, well, the only person that can judge me and tell me what to do is God and Jesus mm -hmm. Christ, and he ain't that person, so, so you know, I just got to get out of there. Well, God puts you there, that boss, whether and, and look, I'm not saying he's a great godly person. He probably doesn't even know the Lord, but he's there. He's the delegated authority, mm -hmm. and you can probably quote exactly what yeah. verse this is from, but one of my favorite quotes and this is paraphrased one of my favorite quotes from jesus in the bible is when they ask him well, what do you think we ought to do about paying these taxes and he picks up a gold coin he says well whose face is that and they said well that's caesar he goes well then rendereth unto caesar what is caesar's and rendereth unto god's what is god's jesus christ himself said pay taxes so all you tax evaders out there just think about that okay god himself said pay taxes and he's not just talking about money he's saying you know was Julius Caesar a prophet furthest thing from it but he's the delegated authority yeah. and and then that kind of brings me to the second page of, of this uh, just a little secondary point I wanted to hit on you know we've talked about how to make yourself valuable we've talked about what to look for uh, you're talking about the apples and bananas and things and that's mm -hmm. another thing folks that, that'll deter a lot of good workers that they kill themselves they give it a hundred and ten percent and then they start thinking, oh, well, they're just ungrateful. They're not ungrateful. You did a great job. Uh, you just didn't do it. You just didn't do the job. And, and let me just say this is, is when you go in and, and let's say you, you, you know, some, some things you, we're talking about adding value. We, we haven't even tapped. We haven't even really tapped into that whole conversation yet. We just briefly hit it. But let me just share with you what you don't want to do. I, I say some L's. I'm going to give you some L's. One is don't be late. Just don't, look, I don't care if everybody and their mama shows up to work late. Don't be late. That, that's, that's a character flaw. That, 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 that really is a character flaw because that's, that's who you are. Number two, don't be lazy. I know people who will watch women carry stuff, and they'll sit there and get in a conversation while that woman's carrying chairs and tables and and we're talking about young people. And I'm not talking about young 18. I'm talking about 30, 35-year-old men sitting there watching 
and they're just they're just lazy. When you go to work, you're going to be there eight hours. Go ahead. It, it passes by so much better and sweeter if you'll just do something. And, and, so, and then don't lack loyalty. Just don't be a disloyal person. If you've got an issue with, with your boss or your mother or your leader or your coach or your professor, be, be Christian enough. I'm talking to Christians now. Be Christian enough or at least have enough character to go to that person, sit down with that person, and share with that person your disagreements. And you'll find out that a lot of times when you go in there with an attitude uh, that, that's nice and welcoming, not I'm fixing to get you straight or I'm about to get you straight attitude to your boss, and you tell them what it, a strong leader even might get a little nervous and get a little excited and say something, but when he backs away from you, He's going to realize that you came with the right attitude. And what he's going to do is he's going to appreciate you and respect you. But to go get two or three different people to back up what you say and have those little, I call them kindergarten conversations, you know, let me tell you what Bill did and, you know, and Sally. And that's just so, that's just so beneath who you really are as a person and so beneath the situation, and that don't have to, that doesn't have to take place. And you know, our natural sinful instincts kick in, and at first, just just again, just how us humans think, you're thinking, well, what is he hiding? I mean, is he going to want to filter this? I mean, he, I'm only allowed to talk to him. Well, this is dictatorship. Well, folks, we've all played this game, and when we were little kids at VBS, you ever play the game telephone? You sit in a circle with like ten people whisper one thing by the time it gets back to you it's changed so much that's real okay that's that's why leaders prefer that they're not trying to hide anything they're not trying to okay let me get this grievance put it under the rug here and it's controlled in the blast zone no it's because they know that if you speak to other people first the telephone thing happens by the time it gets to them not only do they have the wrong story but they have to flip through four different versions of that story and find out which one is the real one. This can all be solved if you just go to them first. And you know what amazes me? This is what amazes me. These, uh, these are people you pay. Yeah. <laughs> so you're paying people to be lazy. You're paying people to lack loyalty. And, and, you, and you're paying people to, to be late. And so none of us, me included, I mean, let's just all be honest here. Leaders and everybody, no one likes to be held accountable, but it's necessary. And, uh, you know, we, we're we talking about adding value. If, if you want to add value, that's how you add value. Be on time. Don't lack loyalty. And don't be lazy. I mean, get in there and do your job. And, and if, you know, I've heard people say this uh, through the many years I've led. People have been leading them since I'm 18. I'm 51. I've been in the military and all this other stuff in different churches. And, um, you know, they, they'll, they'll say this sometimes. I'm, I'm confused. I don't, what am I supposed to be doing? I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. Well, go to your boss. Go to your boss. Uh, and a good leader is going to write down those expectations for you. And, and a good follower is going to ask for them. But, if you are confused at this point exactly how you're adding value or if you're adding value, go sit down with a pen, with a notebook, or with your phone. I know we're in modern-day technology here. And just write it down and say, listen, uh, what, what is it you're expecting me to do? Uh, wh you know, what? And, and one time in my early ministry, um, I was wanting my staff, probably 25 years ago, I was wanting my staff to be something. I was wanting them to to be flexible. I was wanting them to be loyal or whatever the word would be. And I came to the conclusion one day is I said, you know, I'm, I'm so disappointed in what my staff's doing. And I had to ask myself, what is it I've really asked them to do and be? And I started writing. Now watch this. When you write down things, it takes the emotion out. So I said, you know what? These, 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 these staff really need to change. And let me write down exactly what they need to do to change. And I grabbed a pen and I started writing, and I went, number one, I couldn't even pinpoint it. Mm -hmm. It was emotion. And then I had to say, now, what is it I'm really, oh, I want them to be flexible. And I wrote down flexible. I want them to be committed. And I wrote down, and I wrote down ten things after the emotion subsided, ten things 
of what really I'm expecting. Now watch this. Love has never made anyone a good mind reader. So how could they give me what I wanted when I didn't even really know what I wanted until I pinned it on a piece of paper? But then once I did that, I'm like, that's it. I'm like, that's it. Now I know what I want. Now I can expect them to give me what I want. And now there's no confusion. And when you write stuff on paper, it helps people because we all get a little, have this thing called amnesia. You didn't say this. You didn't do that. You didn't. Oh. No, he, here it is. And, and get your boss to sign it. Yeah. And get your employees to sign it. You say, well, they shouldn't have to sign all that. They ought to just trust me. Well, when, when I write down stuff, it helps the clarity to be there. And then what you read, you might infer that differently. You might infer that incorrectly. So I'll get them to read it back. Like, now you tell me what that means. And they might say, well, it means this and this. I'm going, oh, no, 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 no. See, already I wrote it down and thought you inferred it correctly. But, but what I wrote down and how you interpreted, that's what inferred me. And, you know, you know, you interpreted it differently than what I anticipated. So when you read now, watch this. The expectations are there. Boss knows what he wants. Employee knows what they, they need to do. You comprehend it correctly. I communicate it correctly. Everybody signed. And now guess what it comes down to? Integrity. There we go. Integrity. Yes, so that's how you add value. Yeah, and, and you know, that actually kind of, we kind of split that road a little bit. We were kind of talking about, and when I say the colloquial you, I meant like you as in a future employee, but now we've kind of branched over into the employer. It's all about, folks, communication, communication, that's exactly communication. That's right. And, you know, I've ran into this problem. You know, this was my first time ever actually being in charge of other people as a leader. I think I fit into, I mean, it's just me. I think I fit in pretty well. You know, I thought it was going to be like putting a circle peg in a square hole. No, you're doing not, a great job. Not that way. But the thing is. You come is in I've teachable, first of all. You didn't come in trying to teach me something. You no. teach the staff. You were wise enough to come in and assess the situation and see what was here, what was working. But then we invited you to make things better. We Absolutely. didn't get you here just to follow suit. We got yeah. you here to take us to another level. And, folks, that's the biggest difference right there between a leadership position and a regular position. And some people get in these nice job positions. or And, and not necessarily it has to be like a job, but let's say like uh, with a with an extracurricular group. It could be a college fraternity. It could be an intramural softball team, anything like that. If you're just that regular position, you're important. But with a leadership position, you have to understand that a regular worker is there to maintain what you've done. They are the people keeping the lights on, keeping the floors mopped. You know, they're, they're keeping that machine running. The leader is the one that says, okay, engine's running. Let's upgrade that engine. Let's add some of this, some of that. And, so, and, and, and let me say this, Landon, uh, if, if I may, is that, you being the leader under me, and then, of course, we have the executive assistant and things of that sort, but, but you being a leader and having people follow you, you have to learn that it's one voice and many echoes. A double-minded double church is unstable in all their ways. And I know it's a double-minded man, but it has to be one voice. You, you're not a robot. You, you're, I'm not a dictator, but there's one vision. And a double, a double vision church is unstable in all their ways. And, and what I would say to you is that, you know, when you follow suit and you find out what we're doing, that doesn't mean you don't give suggestions and opinions and make things better. But the overall direction of that work spot it comes from the pastor on down. And, and it's not a chain of command. It's a line of responsibility. Now, let me explain something. God flows. And, and it says in 133, Blessed are those that dwell together in unity, for there God's commanded the blessings in life forevermore. And he talked about the oil flowing from the beard down to the very bottom of Aaron's garments. You notice the flow? 
God's a God of order. He's a God of flow. Satan's a God of disorder. And he wants to cut the flow off. And so when you come in, you add value by complementing the vision and not competing against the vision. And if, and if in that time frame you're leading people and you feel like what's being passed down to you is not communicated clearly or you don't agree with it, well, that's just, that's just part of life. Me and my wife, uh, she, we don't agree all the time, you know, about the same thing. And I tell her all the time, you can be wrong if you want to. <laughs> but, but no. but, but Use we that line with caution, people. <laughs> but we have to talk to each other. But, you know, if any time we give in direction and you receive it and you have to pass on that direction and you're not comfortable, come in and see us and talk to us and say, hey, look, I think we can do things better here. I think, but don't go get with your team and talk about how stupid your pastor is that, or your coach is or your professor is. That, that's called rebellion, and that right there is from Satan. That's not from God. That, now you're competing against the vision, and you're not completing the vision. So you're not adding value. Absolutely. Yes, sir. I was saying, um, you know, you actually, in a way, just kind of saved me there. I was, I was thinking of this long paragraph of how to explain this. That was a much better way of doing it. But with, when you echo that vision... I'm just going to use myself as an example. Uh, when I'm the media director here, and I have my, my excellent, excellent teenage staff from the youth yeah, group. Yeah, you got some great me. guys in that booth. We're so, grat so glad and so thankful for all what y'all do up there. They have absorbed a lot of information in a short amount of time. But, you know, I was, I'd tell them to do something, and then I'd come back and change. Then I'd come back and change. And then I'm thinking, wait a minute. Just like what you were saying with writing the things down. Uh, you got to get that. You got to get that concrete laid, that foundation laid. Otherwise, you don't know what you want because you're kind of going, you know, making it up as you go. But another thing is, I always and, and folks, I don't do this, and, and I'm not recommending you go act like a like, like a little kid and your boss, your dad. Hey, dad, is this okay? Is this okay? Is this good? No, that's no, no. What no. you do is you know clear. You figure out what that vision is, and then when I get ready to implement something in my department. I look at it as tools, okay? I'm like, all right, look, I want to take this off and put a two millimeter on there. Go from one millimeter, two millimeter, we're going to make it bigger. Well, wait, is it going to fit? It, are the threads going to fit Brother Keith's threads? Is it going to yeah. line in here? If the threads don't fit, I know what you want. You've told me what you want, and I can just, you know, I, I, I can just feel in the church culture what you have going on. So when I get ready to do something, Oh, it's the coolest thing in the world to me. And I start playing around with all this cool technology. I'm like, man, I can make it look like a Spielberg movie. But then I'm like, is that going to fit the threads? Is and, it going to be stepping yeah. away? And the thing is, too, is I'm more project. So I'm like, you know, I'm the initiator and y'all are the completers. It doesn't mean you're less than. It means you're important. It means if you don't complete it, we're in a mess. So you're really as, as important, if not more important, because... A dream without a plan executed equals a nightmare. So understand that the project that I have in my mind or the actual thing that we need to do or accomplish, I'm cool with the, the process, and any good leader would be. So, for instance, let me give you an example. Uh, hey, Landon, you and I are going to go to Walmart, uh, meet me at Walmart at 3 o'clock, um, or just meet me as soon as we leave the building, as soon as you can get there. Let's go. You take your own vehicle, I'm taking mine. Well, I might go down. I'm bad with roads. What's this road in front of Ace Hardware? Susec? Uh, Is that Susec? I believe so. Okay. Believe well, anyway, <laughs> I may go the back way. You may take 49, exit off. Here's the deal. Are you going to show up at Walmart? See, two different directions, but the, the end result was the vision was accomplished are two different ways, let, let me say that. So the process, you, you, you wanted to go a different direction than I wanted to go as far as getting, but the end result was you gave me what I wanted. I wanted you at Walmart as soon as we left here. And you went there. And so it's not about big eyes and little U's when you're trying to add value to the workplace. It's not about a dictator. It's not about a control freak. It's called communication. There's one boss, one leader. And uh, that leader has leaders, and that leader has leaders. And if you get into that flow, you'll be blessed like he said Aaron was. But, boy, when you get out of that flow, you disrupt the whole system. And when you disrupt the whole system, 
a leader's responsibility is to find out why aren't things flowing and to find out who is not in that flow or who's causing that flow to, to, to cease. And I think that's why when you, uh, when you are starting to get those doubts about your job, should I really be here? I know God called me here originally. How do I know if things have changed? When it, I mean, you got to pray on those things because if you start doing your job, if you, if, if you hit that job 100% every day and then all of a sudden you bump it down to 98, I mean, we're talking 2%. It's going to show. So, you know, even if, even if you hate your boss, it, if, at least for the respect of your coworkers, everybody in that hole under that roof, I mean, even if you want to hurt the boss, you're hurting everybody else with him. So it's just it's a very delicate balance. And last thing I wanted to touch on, because this one, uh, I, I really got some clarity on this the other night. Um, me, I've, I've gotten back to where I pray regularly. Uh, I do study the Bible regularly with our staff. and You I've need even it too, Land. I, I <laughs> don't. We, I we both do, brother. I'm just hey, 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 yeah. And we then I've even gotten to the part where, where I do it on my own time again. It, it's something I'm not really necessarily, a, I'm not going to say afraid, but something I don't turn my nose up at anymore. It's, it's a pretty good read. You check it out. There's <laughs> and, and there's different versions too. If you can't, if you're not into all that thou and thy stuff, they got other translations. But uh, the thing with the Bible is, is uh, I wasn't necessarily studying when when this came to me. But me and you had had a, the, uh, we were actually planning for this podcast. And when we were doing our show prep, we came up with the topic of rebellion. And you know, you had said uh, that all rebellion comes from Satan. Yeah. And rebellion has been here before man even evolved because yeah. it all happened. It didn't in start heaven. with your boss. It started with Lucifer exactly. when he said, I will. Folks, that is something here that, you know, the Chinese religions, they always, they're, they're yin and yang thing. There's light in the world, and there's dark in the world, and the world operates on a balance of those two. Well, that in a way is true when he translated here because what did the Bible say? Satan, Lucifer was not cast down to hell. He was sent here. So he's here. Yeah. He is, there is darkness in this world. Jesus Christ uh, if, you know, came later on. There's light in the world. So rebellion is the opposite of everything we've been talking about. And folks, there is, and this is just this, the revelation I got, there is no real gray area. You're either doing right or you're rebellious, and you may not even have that malicious mindset of, well, I'll show him. You don't, no, no, no. That's not the only form of rebellion. If you get that thing, well, I don't know, you know, you you can be rebelling and, and not, not even know. A word. And not even know you're rebelling. It's or up not here. Not even say a word. Exactly. It could be right here. Rebellion, it's like that little boy that was told, his teacher set him down and said, don't you get up again. You better not stand up again, little Johnny. And um, so he stood up again. That teacher shoved him back down in that chair or placed him back down in that chair. And uh, she said, you better not get up again. And he looked at that teacher. He said, well, I may not be standing up on the outside, but on the inside, I'm still standing up. And that's what rebellion is. Rebellion can be a voice that's loud. It can be a quiet voice not saying anything. And, you know, if, if you were, you know, I, I, well, hold on. Let me change my words here. If you were to... Uh, get called to heaven. Uh, that's a better way to say it. If you were to get called to heaven this evening and you've physically done everything right, you've done what people ask, you've showed up, but every time you did it, you're like, what do they want now? And you get to, you get to the gates and God walks out and he says, all right, my son, let's, uh, let's do an evaluation before I let you in here. And he goes, well, yeah, God, I did everything. He goes, but did you though? I mean, you did it but you didn't like doing it. Now, God doesn't say pretend to be happy and excited about every little thing. Of course we're going to get fed up That's with right. stuff. But if, if, it's a, if it's a true chore to do something correctly, whether that be making yourself valuable or whether that just be, you know, just, just being an overall inviting, well, nice person. You can be an introvert. You can be short, but just, just a good, spirited person. That's a chore. Well, yeah, you did it. But did you do it? Yeah, you know? and, and let me just say rebellion. You know, when you talk about rebellion, Isaiah chapter 14, Ezekiel 28, is we 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 got to understand that Satan does not want us to get along. He does not want us to do right. He does not want us to love God. And our world is reeling to and fro in rebellion. And 
And I want, I want us to understand something that when you, when you talk about rebellion, see, the reason why we have that propensity in us and that tendency in us is, is because we're all born sinners. You don't have to teach a kid to do wrong and lie and not share. You've got to teach them to do right. Because we're all born sinners. We're all born with that tendency to go a little bit more than what we should and do a little bit more than what we're in the bad way. And so when Lucifer was worshiping in heaven, he led worship in heaven. And man, he was worshiping in heaven. And he got tired, I guess, one day and said, well, I'm not going to worship God. I think we're going to change this whole corporation around here. I think I'm going to take over. I I think the way we're doing for God is wrong. And I, I just think that I won't worship. And he said, I will exalt myself above the... Uh, 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 he said, I will ascend into heaven. Notice that, I will. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High God. He said, I'm going to quit worshiping you. And you're going to start worshiping worshiping me so god created lucifer watch this and lucifer created satan when he said them i wills no longer god your will but what i want that day lucifer created satan and one third of the angels now can you believe this that anybody would follow an igmo like that i mean you rebel against god and you would just think, well, that's one Igmo. He's pretty, you know, a few sandwiches short of a picnic, but nobody's going with him. Oh, no, relationships are strong. And one-third of the angels followed, followed Satan. Can you believe that? One-third said, we're tired of being happy, provided for, loved, cared, wonderful environment. I think we'll all go be miserable together. And with one-third should have looked at Satan and said, buddy, if you go and we're not going, Toodaloo, say la vie, peace, out. Oh, no. It's like I know you and, you know, Lucifer, you, you're a good person. They all follow that igmo. So anyway, what I'm saying, it started rebellion there. So what you're having in the world is anything that is good, Satan wants to rebel against it. He wants to destroy it. He's turning blacks against whites and whites against black and Republican against Democrat, Democrat against Republican daughters and sons against mamas and daddies mamas and daddies against daughters i mean and we see everybody and everything but satan we don't see him destroying but why do i have the hate in my heart and the dislike for authority today why is that why is it that i'm anti everything except bad it's that rebellion that's in us and satan knows our flesh and he knows how to inflame that. He knows how to make us mad and angry. And we'll attack good and godly things just like he did. Yeah, and, and folks, I just want to touch on that. Uh, all of that makes a lot of sense to me. I hope it makes sense to you as well. Uh, also, be sure to leave a comment. If you do have any questions about this uh, table talk, just timestamp where you have a question. We'll get back to you on that. In a timely fashion. And also... And man, would be more than glad. No, no, no. Hey, I'll even send you an audio message, man. We'll just talk, you know. But uh, no, no, but one thing I was saying was, um, you know, <laughs> fo and, and, and normally it seems like the younger guys uh, also want to say, uh, you know, all of you uh, high schoolers that, that kind of got a halfway graduation because of the virus and all that, congratulations again. Uh How's the real world going, huh? You cup a few months <laughs> in, huh? Yeah, yeah. I, I always feel like the younger people, the high schoolers, they're like, "Oh yeah, I'm not gonna rebel. I'm not gonna do this." Don't ever think. I don't care if you're an old man that has a wall full of degrees and war medals, and you've done some stuff, or if you're 18 just finishing a high school. You can never overcome rebellion because think about this. It says clearly in the Bible. This isn't just me talking, but angels. Or, you know, we like to think of them, uh, artists and stuff like to think of them as just good-looking people with wings and robes. But really what an angel truly is, the, the, the science word for it 
I know y'all thinking, oh, he said the S word. He said science in here. But, you know, one thing, the scientific term is celestial, a celestial being. And they're saying that a celestial being, the Bible even says that when, they, when the angel appeared uh, in the Christmas story, he was a ball of light. You know, they are, they are, compared to us folks, they are powerful, powerful things. If an angel manifested itself physically, I mean, we would probably die from looking at it. Well, I mean, well, And let me add to that, you know, and the Bible says in Ezekiel 28, and in Isaiah 14 that he was perfect in wisdom Lucifer was so now his wisdom is perverted so that's how he can fool us and deceive us there's a way that seems right unto man but the end there of the ways of death now when Lucifer can appear as an angel of light you got to have some discernment because he can make things look so 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 true and be so so wrong and you you mentioned something, and I know we got to go, but I want to, I want to, I want to end with this. You mentioned about the college students, how the real, I meant the high school students, how the real world's going. How is it, huh? Yeah, yeah. I want to say this to them: if I could do it all over again, I would, I would love everybody, of course. Um, you know, don't think you any better than anyone else, but I would hang around people who love God and who are trying to do the right things. That, that doesn't mean that you separate yourself from the world and you throw stones and you think you're more holy. And I, That's not the point. The point is birds of a feather flock together. I never knew what all that flocking stuff was. When my parents told me birds of a feather flock together, I go, I don't have bird problems or flock <laughs> problems. What are you talking about? But then I've come to learn that it's not long. Listen, this is important here now for you listening uh, by, by way of podcast is that when it comes to relationships, the weaker person will always dominate the relationship. It's not the strongest person. It's the weakest person. And, and you got to be careful because people know if you're a follower or a leader. They know your proclivities, your mannerisms, your idiosyncrasies. They, they know, and unfortunately, I, I'm not turning you against people, but a lot of people will use you and what they'll do is they'll manipulate you because they know that you're going to follow them and they'll use your relationship to hurt other people and so young people it's important to be around the right people pray for everybody don't ever think you're better than everybody else but if that person you're hanging around is anti-rebellion if they're rebellious and anti-authority listen to me I want to look straight in this camera. Don't walk away from them. Run. Run wide open and say, I'm not going to be a part of you going against daddies and mamas and coaches and authority because who you hang around greatly determines your success. It greatly determines your success or your failure. So we're, I've been focused in on adding value. You kind of brought the rebellion issue in. I think they're... Uh, heads and tails of the same coin. I think you got to be careful there that on this side you can err. On this side you can succeed. And one, God's on that side and Satan's on this side. Right's on this side and wrong's on that side. So I would say to you, in recapping, pray, read, study. What can I do to add value? Write it down. Communicate it back. Get an updated report. How am I doing if you think you're failing? Hang around the right people. Run from anti-authority people. Let them go be a hellion if they want to, but run from them. And hang around the right people and pray for everyone. And then be the example you expect to see. And that's what I'd say in closing. And, and, and what I would say is word for word that, except for these last two, you know, two little points is, uh, you speaking back on rebellion is uh, yeah just know that no one even even the fearless leader you followed your entire adult life whether it could be a boss a parent or anybody right. if if a perfect celestial being made of pure light energy can be subjected to rebe not even subjected to rebellion but create rebellion you a human being old. has no no chance you're right and also Folks, when you pray on something, like he said, if, if, you, if you have somebody in your friend circle and you need to run from that anti-establishment, from that rebellious person, and you pray on it, I know 
our emotions can get in the way, and that just makes us human, and God knows that. But when you ask God for something, you need to stay open-minded because oftentimes we'll pray just to make us feel better about it because, yeah, I prayed on it. But even, and then that thought starts hitting, hey, you need to cut ties. Well, no, I ain't going to do that. Don't just look for the answer you want to hear. That's right. You're going to hear some stuff up here you don't want to hear. But yeah. you just got, I mean, that's that, I mean, that's why you prayed, right? And that's got to drive God crazy. He's like, here he is asking for the answer. Here, oh, but it ain't his answer. Well, it ain't going to change, you know. So so always keep stay open-minded. But, folks, I really do hope that that, that, that might have, you know, turned some light bulbs on for some people. And if in the very least, you, you know, you at least got to hear a nice, good conversation. Thank you so much, Pastor, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Uh, we're going to try day. to do this every week, folks, uh, pending this busy man's schedule. And we're also going to be getting some guests in from around the community. Yes. We can also get some telephone guests in. So if any of y'all have any good recommendations, drop them in the comments. Send, up a, send us a message. We'll see how feasible that is. We, you know, your feedback is everything because at the end of the day, we're doing this for all of you guys online. Share it. Introduce some people to howchurch.net, and we will see you guys next week. Thank you again, Pastor. Thank you, Landon. I appreciate you, buddy.